Folks, we have spent the summer so far in the Psalms, and if you're unfamiliar with Psalms, it's basically one big songbook, right? It's like a collection of greatest hits. See, sometimes it's easy to look at Psalms and just read it like a scripture, right? But actually, it's music. It's set the notes and ancient instruments that were played together as a way to worship God. There's songs of joy and pain, songs of loss and love, songs that question where God is, and songs that point to his goodness. These songs would have been played on ancient versions of guitars, pianos, drums, trumpets, you name it. And it got me thinking about music culture today, not so much about the instruments that we use, right? But more about how we consume and how we listen to music today. So I've brought a few things along with me, right? Does anybody remember before CDs, there were the giant CDs, right? And I actually managed to find this one in a record shop. Who remembers that when you used to listen to music on one of these bad boys, right? Yeah, a few people, okay. I was going to bring a Glenn Miller one to bring everybody with me, right? <laughs> but uh, does anybody, do, do you remember, some of you may still have them, do you remember those CDs, now that's what I call music, right? And it was like the summary of the music in the year. This one is from 1984, and it's the third one ever published, right? So 50 quid after the service, if anybody, no. <laughs> Here's some of the bands that were about, and I'm not even talking, this isn't a retro, this is like, this was in the charts at the time. So Duran Duran, recognize anybody? Yeah. yeah. Take on me. Uh, Sister Sledge. <laughs> uh, Phil Collins. In the air. To- Andrew, get in the drums. Where's, uh, we've got Queen. Uh, Banana, 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 thank you. <laughs> the pastor's not well, somebody help him. Tina Turner, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Womack and Woma, Womack, Bob Marley, Wham, wake me up before you. The Weather Girls, it's raining men, I know that's the prayer of some of you today. Uh, and including other bands like Madonna and things like that, not in that CD, but in other ones. Um, does anybody remember, uh, it moved on really from the vinyls to the cassette play, right? I remember those. I aren't, I'm not old enough to remember actually using these, but I remember when cars had them at some stage as well. This one was given to me by um, Ivan. It's actually Pastor John Payton, who was the first pastor of the Carrick Church, which is really, really cool. We should maybe put that somewhere. I see it'd be a good wee bit in the archives. Does anybody remember the Walkman, right? Now, here's where the generations of listening to music differently gets funny. I asked my dad, would you bring an old Walkman that we have? I was expecting a CD one. He brought me a cassette one, (laughs) right? But it wasn't so cool when you had a Walkman. I remember the CD ones. You could pop it in. They were always too big to fit in your pocket. That was the frustrating thing, right? But you could take your music anywhere. It was class. And nowadays, what you do is you flick through your phone to pick a song. But in those days, you had to open your CD case and flick through to find the CD, right? It's amazing how things change. I've got a CD as well. And for many of us, maybe you're still using CDs at the moment. I know they're still kind of waning in popularity, but they're still about... Do you remember how frustrating it used to get when your CD got scratched? And it was always when it came to your favorite song, right? You thought George Michael had the hiccups, right? It just, it was so frustrating when your CD got scratched. And then we moved on to my favorite one, right? When these came out, this revolutionized listening to music. Anybody remember the iPod? Yeah, I feel like I'm giving a presentation this morning. The new iPod. Unbelievable. This was my partner in school in the study room. If you didn't have an iPod, you were sunk in the library. These were the go-to gadgets for listening to music. And then, of course, later on, the iPod was made completely defunct because we were given mobiles, weren't we? And instead of having to go and get a vinyl, a Walkman, a CD, a cassette, whatever it may have been, now, for many of us, music's in our pockets. We can listen to songs. We can listen to music anywhere. And I think, church, that really represents the change in our society and how things never stay the same, but change is a part of life. It was JFK who said, the only thing that never changes is change itself. But you know, church, I wonder how just in music, do you ever notice how some things change, but others stay the same? So, for example, maybe one record you bought on vinyl or cassette 
you're still listening to years later on CD or on your phone, right? Maybe Wham! was your jam back in the day and you bought a vinyl and years later you're still sticking it on the playlist on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to music. Some things change, church, and other things stay the same. How we listen to music changes, but often the music that we listen to doesn't change. And you know, I wonder, is it the same in life and in faith? Even though we live in days of change, take the last few years, we've had Brexit, sea borders, pandemics, war in Europe, is China going to invade Taiwan? Is there going to be a recession or is there not going to be a recession? And that's before we even get to the change in our own personal lives. Change is a part of life. But just like music church, just like Psalms, we may live in a world that is rapidly changing, but there is one who does not change. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 120 writes this. Psalm 102, sorry. But you remain the same, Lord, and your years will never end. See, the writer of this psalm is trying to piece together the broken pieces of his life. His life has fallen apart. His nation is in ruins. The economy and social structures have been completely destroyed. Even the people's relationship with God has been broken apart. And in the midst of all this change, in the midst of all this desolation, he writes a song. He puts music to the words, Lord, this world is changing, but you remain the same. Church, this morning, we're going to look at what it is to live in an unchanging world, in a changing world, when an unchanging God wants to meet you and I right where we are. Allow me to pray for us just briefly before we do that. Lord, we open our hearts, we open our ears. And no matter what change we're staring at today, Lord, be it for the better. Lord, may it even feel like it's for the worse. Lord, we invite you in to meet us in the change. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. So in times of change, church, I want to bring you three things that we want to look at when it comes to having an unchanging God in a changing world. And I don't know about you, but I think the first thing that we look for when change comes our way is direction, isn't it? The first time any sense of insecurity or when we're not sure of what's going to happen, it's natural within us to get some guidance. If you think about the height of the pandemic, Never in my life did we think we'd be huddling around the TV for a press conference with the Prime Minister, right? When's bars going to let us out? Whose bars going to let us see? How many people? Who has to wear masks? Who doesn't have to wear masks? Can I have this many people? I mean, imagine waiting to ask Boris Johnson how many people you could have in your house, right? And in those days, we thought that was normal because when crisis comes, whether it's national or whether it's personal, we automatically look for direction. We want guidance when change comes our way. And so the first principle for us this morning is this. An unchanging God gives us unchanging truth. Psalm 119.105 says this. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And what I love about Psalm 119, church, is that it understands that navigating our way through life can sometimes feel like walking in the dark. Do you when you turn the light off in the house, but you're too far from the bedroom at night and you have to try and feel your way back, right? That's what life can feel like sometimes. And what Psalm 119 says is that God's unchanging truth, what we call the Bible, illuminates our lives in such a way that it shows us the path and the direction that we are to take, even in changing times. It has so much power that it will light our way when we need it most. But what happens is, if opening unchanging truth, if living in our Bible is more of an occasion than it is a habit, and we've all been there, it's like someone's turned the lights out. And I don't know if you've ever felt like that, where there's been no direction, you're not sure where you're going, and chances are, it's because we've shut out the light that we've been given unchanging truth church has an incredible way of guiding you through your change today it's an unchanging truth it's always relevant 
and it always shines light in the darkest places of our lives. So in World War II, when Britain was getting ready for Germany to invade, one of the things that they did was to prepare for that was that every sign they could get their hands on, they took it away. So road signs, gone. Signs to let you know what town or city or village you were going into, taken away. Why? So that when the enemy forces came in, they didn't know, listen carefully, didn't know where they were. They didn't have any direction. And they would be left in confusion. And the problem is, church, so often we can find ourselves in a place when we don't want to, when we want to ignore some parts of God's word, when we want to edit some parts of unchanging truth in our lives, or we want to cut out some stuff because it's more convenient for how we want to live. It's like taking down God's road signs in our lives. The signs that he puts up to protect us, to put us in the right direction, to keep us in his plan and his will, even when it feels like everything's changing. When we close the unchanging truth, we take down God's signage in our lives and we end up just the same, not knowing where we are, no direction and in confusion. And church, if that's you this morning, the Lord would gently with his father's heart lean in and say, my heart for you is not confusion, but it's clarity and the joy of the Holy Spirit. And if you're here this morning and you're, you're looking for direction, if you feel like you're in a changing time or changing situation, the Lord wants to come alongside you and walk with you, to journey with you through that. And what you'll find is that as you begin to open the word of truth, the unchanging truth of the Bible that God gives, you will find his footsteps catching up with yours. You'll hear his voice. Go left. Go right. Stand still. Move forward. And before you know it, that light will begin to light your path once again. Here's a second principle. We have unchanging faithfulness. At the very end of Matthew's gospel in chapter 28, Jesus resurrected from the dead, gathers his disciples together, and it's kind of like the last team talk before Jesus would ascend to heaven and the Holy Spirit would come. And as he's preparing the disciples for that, and he's telling them to basically go out and reach the world for Jesus, to give them the good news, baptizing, making disciples, and doing incredible things by the power of the Holy Spirit, just like we're called to do together as the church. But as he's looking at these young lads, Jesus knows what they're about to go through. Bear in mind that only one disciple ever died a natural death in old age. Everybody else carried their cross, some figuratively, some literally. And he looks at these lads and he knows what they're about to step into, the journey that they're going to take. And he says at the very end, the last words in Jesus, and they're going to come up on the, on the, on the screen. He says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the book of Matthew closes. You know, church, Jesus knows. He looks at you this morning and he sees what you've been through. He sees what you're going through and he knows what you will go through. And the Lord would stand in front of you and I this morning with unchanging faithfulness and say, I am with you to the very end of time. And church, there will be moments in life, there will be changes in season where only the presence of God walking with us, dwelling on us will be enough. That's why so many psalmists say, Lord, you can take the world but don't take you from me. And church, I'm wondering this morning, is this our opportunity? If you're in a changing season or maybe you're just wanting a touch of God today, is this morning your morning to reach out to him and say, Lord, be with me. Lord, open your eyes to you walking with me. I just hope and pray this morning, church, that those comforting words would rest on us no matter what our week behind or ahead is gonna look like, that no matter what happens, Jesus says, I'm with you to the end. His faithfulness never changes. In the pain, he is faithful. In the confusion, 
he is faithful. When I feel like things are falling apart, he's faithful. Like we prayed earlier, in the valley moments, he's faithful. On the hilltop moments, he is faithful. Church, this morning we have an unchanging, faithful God. Third and final principle is this. We may have unchanging truth. We may have an unchanging, faithful God. But you know, we're actually called to be a changing people. And so often what happens is we feel that we have to stay the exact same from the day that we give our lives to Jesus. Do you know when uh, the railway was brought to the United States, 1800s, and uh, when, it was first, when it first came, people absolutely freaked out. They were like, there's no way this train thing's going to work. If you build tracks through fields, they're going to set crops on fire. People are going to suffocate on the train because it's moving too fast. This is going to be an absolute disaster. Our nation will fall apart. In fact, the governor of New York at the time wrote that God Almighty would never have a human being move so fast. Do you know what the speed of the train was? 30 mile an hour. <laughs> and if you think today and all the change that has happened, by train or by plane, we can cross a continent in a matter of hours. Some change, church, is for good. And there's moments when the Lord will bring change to you and I personally. He will bring change to a church corporately. And sometimes within us, and it, we've all been there, haven't we? Our first thought is to resist change, isn't it? But no, 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 no. I like it how it is. But often, church, the Lord will bring change that you and I might be changed also. Sometimes the Lord will bring change that you and I might be changed also. This is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, he is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. It's the working of the heart, church that the Lord would have us increasingly become more and more like Jesus. And so whether change feels good to you at the moment, whether change maybe feels painful and difficult, which it can do at times, the Lord has a way of bringing everything that shifts and moves in our lives and making us more like him. Church this morning, is our hearts soft enough are our ears open enough to say, Jesus, change me in every area that you have to. Jesus, make me more like you. Because that's the beauty of the journey with him. That as we walk and as we journey with him, we look more and more like the sun.